They're all here. These okay. are your helpers right here. But they gotta stand on the stand where they are. They're your helpers. Yes, I know. Watch your mouth, Virginia. Sometimes. Your I'm mic won't turn Watch your mouth. <laughs> like I tell dirty jokes. I can't tell. I'm gonna have to do this all night. I see. Or do like this. Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order at 7:01 p.m. on Monday, 21st. April. Certainly want to welcome all of you that are in attendance with us this evening. If we could just take a moment, uh, silent meditation, please. Thank you. I'm going to ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the pledge along with his assistants and Stand up to all the. Cups that are Do you like this? Guys? Okay. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> We're assisted tonight by, I guess, the Cub Scouts from First Calvary Baptist Church. Is that correct? That's right. All right, great. The Tiger Cubs, the Tiger Cubs and Wolves, Pack 108, Den Leader Eddie White. Uh, stand up, you guys. Yeah. Uh, and they are from First Calvary Baptist Church. <laughs> Good to see you. And so they came earlier, um, and I talked with them briefly on how they can better serve uh, the community. And several of them are already serving uh, the community by helping the elderly and raking leaves for their neighbors and just doing some marvelous kinds of things. So we expect great things from them. And thank you so much, parents and cub leaders, scout leaders, for all the work that you're doing with these boys. They are going to be great men one day. Thank you. Great. I would ask the clerk if she would call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Katati. Here. Councilmember Davis. Here. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. And Councilmember Shul. Uh, we have three proclamations that we would like to present this evening. Uh, the one, the first one is recognizing Earth Day and would ask Rhonda Parker, she, Director of uh, Parks and Recreation. Whereas a sound and natural environment is the foundation of a healthy society and a robust economy, whereas human activities in various locations around the globe are causing severe environmental damage that threatens human life, human health, and diminishes our planet's ability to sustain a diverse community of life, whereas the knowledge of ways to live in harmony with our environment and methods and technologies to establish and accomplish this in already exists, whereas local communities can do much to reverse environmental degradation and contribute to building a healthy society by addressing issues such as energy use, transportation, waste prevention, and sprawl, whereas there are sound economic, environmental, and social reasons for local governments to initiate energy efficiency and renewable energy practice, whereas the 2014 Durham Earth Day Festival will be celebrated on April 27th and will bring together the community in a festive atmosphere to raise awareness of environmental issues, share knowledge, and promote positive action that protects and enhances the quality of life for Durham residents, now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim Sunday, April 27, 2014, as Earth Day in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance by encouraging residents, businesses, and institutions to use Earth Day to celebrate the Earth and commit to building a sustainable society. Witness my hand, Corporate Seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 21st day of April 2014. 
I would like to present this to Rhonda for any comments that she may have. Rhonda Parker, Director of Durham Parks and Recreation. Thank you, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Temp Cora Cole McFadden, City Council, City Manager, City Attorney, and residents of the City of Durham. I would like to, if you'd like to learn how to love the earth, please come and join us this Sunday and we will show you ways to help uh, reserve, preserve energy for the City of Durham and also to reduce our carbon footprint. We have some new um, features this year that we're excited about and that we want to share with you. And this will be this Sunday from 12 to 5 at Durham Central Park. We have the Farmer's Lane with fresh local produce. We have Trosa's store with gently used clothing and small items. And e-cycling and recycling yard where we have drive-through recycling, drop off for electronics, plastic bags, and clothing. And in addition to the other activities, and this event is sponsored by Durham Parks and Recreation in cooperation with Keep Durham Beautiful. But we have activities for children, Earth Day Parade, Sustainability Expo, where you can learn all kinds of new techniques from local nonprofits and businesses. We have live music, local food trucks, eco lounge, and even bike valet. And it's free admission, it's rain, and sh rain or shine. So come down and, and participate and enjoy how, what we have here in Durham and how we can keep making Durham better. But also on Saturday, to kick off our Earth Day activities for the weekend, Solid Waste has a management department at the Earth Day kickoff. It's the e-waste recycling and paper shredding event that they do every year in conjunction with us. But this will be on Saturday from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Durham County Memorial Stadium. And so staff will be there on hand to help unload old electronics and paper. And this event, too, is also free and open to the public. Thank you, and we hope to see you this weekend. I ask Vicki Westbrook, Assistant Director, Department of Water Management, if she would join me. Hi, Vicki. Whereas the city of Durham continues to explore ways to manage residential consumption of water and to inspire its residents to preserve and protect our natural resources, especially our water supplies, whereas the City of Durham, as an EPA Water Sense partner, encourages our community to conserve water and be water efficient whenever possible, whereas the Wildland Foundation has sponsored the National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation Challenge for three years, promoting active competition among cities of all sizes across the nation to reduce water use by adoption of water efficient behaviors and practices, Whereas from April 1st to April 30th, 2014, the city wishes to inspire its residents and its neighboring communities to participate in the challenge by making a series of online pledges to reduce their impact on the environment by decreasing water use and striving to be more water efficient for the period of one year. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bellville, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, proclaim that the city is an active participant in the Wallen Foundation National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation and encourage Durham citizens to take the conservation challenge between April 1st, 2014 and April 30th, 2014 by making an online pledge at www.mywaterpledge.com. That's www.mywaterpledge.com. This proclamation shall be effective immediately and witness on hand in Corpus Hill, City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the 21st day of April, 2014. I'm going to present this to Vicki for comments she may have. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Water Management, I would like to encourage each of you to go to mywaterpledge.com. Since we uh, kicked off this with a news release earlier this month, City of Durham is in eighth uh, in ninth place among the cities that are listed. So there are, we are in the group between 100,000 and 299,999,000 people. We're in ninth place. What I have noticed is there are actual movement taking place. So some cities have dropped off the list. I would like for Durham to move higher. Since people started pledging as of April 1st, the uh, population in these cities has pledged to save 843 million gallons of water a year. It's very easy to do. It pops you through about three or four screens. And when I did it for myself, I committed to save 56,000 gallons of water per year for myself. So this is an exciting opportunity for us to participate. 
It's very fitting that we're in place with uh, Earth Day, Earth Week, Earth Year, and I encourage all of y'all to go to mywaterpledge.com and pledge today. Thank you. I'd like to ask Reginald Johnson, Director of Community Development, if he would join me. Thank you, Reginald. Whereas the Community Development Block Grant Program enacted into law under the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 and the Home Partnership Rule Program enacted into law under the National Affordable Housing Act of 1990, whereas the CDBG and Home Programs provide communities with the flexible resources to address a wide range of unique community development needs, whereas the CDBG and Home Programs primary objectives are to support communities by providing decent housing, creating suitable living environments, and expanding economic opportunities to households of low and moderate incomes, whereas throughout their 40-year and 24-year histories, the CDBG and home programs have helped create strong partnerships between federal, state, and local governments, the private sector, and nonprofit partners to successfully carry out activities that improve the lives of low and moderate income households, of low and moderate income and revitalized neighborhoods where they live, whereas the City of Durham has used CDBG and home funds to leverage additional resources for preserving housing through re rehabilitation, creating home ownership and rental housing opportunities, revitalizing neighborhoods, assisting the homeless, supporting job creation, and improvement of community facilities, improvement of community facilities, improvement of with the participation of Citizens Advisory Committee, whereas community development block grant and home programs have positively impacted the lives of residents and made a visible difference in the Durham community. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim April 21st to April 26th, 2014, as National Community Development Week in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of observances being held this week, showcasing projects and programs supported by CDBG and home funds in the city. With my hand, Corporate Silver City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 21st day of April 2014. And we'll present this to Reginald for any comments that he may have. Thank you, Mayor Bell, uh, members of the City Council, for the 2014 National Community Development Week proclama proclamation recognizing 40 years of building strong communities. On behalf of the Community Development Department, the Citizens Advisory Committee, all of our partners, as well as the Durham residents, all of the Durham residents and families that have benefited for these from these funds, I'm humbled to accept this proclamation. I especially want to recognize the Citizens Advisory Committee, a committee appointed by the City Council, as well as the County Commissioners who advise the Community Development Partner on, on, on allocating funding. The Chair is DeWarren Langley. Thank you. I don't see any of our partners right away, but if we, any other partners would like them to stand, we cannot do this work without all of our partners uh, here in the city of Durham. Mayor, in celebration of this week, each week, each day of this week, we're having an activity to showcase the positive impacts of CDBG home and leverage other leverage dollars in meeting the needs of Durham's community. For example, tonight we are honored to receive this proclamation on tomorrow, Tuesday, we will feature an urgent repair project. On Wednesday, we'll feature a rapid rehousing overview at Williams Square at 501 East Carver Street at 10 a.m. On Thursday, there will be a fair housing and sustainability conference at 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. at the Cotton Room, 807 East Main Street. On Friday, there will be a service project and tour at Urban Ministries, 14 Liberty Street at 8 a.m. On, also on Friday, the Duke University Home Buyers Club will tour the homes at the bungalows at Southside. On Saturday, there will be a housing rehabilitation project kickoff with Habitat for Humanity at 2010 Ash Street at 8.30 a.m. And Mayor, I can just tell you that uh, great things are happening in Durham. Let me ask, are there comments by members of the council on any particular item? Okay. Recognize the mayor pro tem. Um, 
uh, as I was about to go upstairs, I saw the staff of the Carolina Theater um, <laughs> coming into uh, City Hall, and they will be celebrating the contract agreement uh, after they leave here tonight. It is on consent agenda, so you don't have to say anything. But you can stand up and be acknowledged. This is the staff of the Carolina Theater. Everybody. <laughs> Thank you. I hope we pass that contract tonight, Mr. Mayor. We will. Let me ask whether there are prior to items first by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Good evening, everyone. Uh, no priority items. Likewise, city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And uh, likewise, the city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the agenda will proceed with the consent agenda. Uh, any item on the consent agenda may be pulled by a member of the council or a member of the public, and we'll discuss that later in the program. Uh, otherwise, I'll read the heading of each item. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is workforce development board appointment. Item three is award of dedicated housing funds and home funds to Durham Community Land Trustees, Inc for the renovation of rental housing units in the Southside neighborhood. Okay. Item four is partial payment to Parkwood Volunteer Fire Department for fire protection in Southern Durham. Item five is interlocal cooperation agreement between the city of Durham and the city of Fayetteville for use of the city's 800 megahertz radio system. Item six is the building and services agreement between the city of Durham and the Carolina Theater of Durham, Inc. Item seven is telecommunications license agreement with Microelectronics Center of North Carolina, and I'll pull that item. Item eight is CIP ordinance amendment for Bay Point phase three, Green Gardens phase two, and Windmere Ridgefield developments reimbursement. Item nine is grant agreement for sidewalk construction on Campus Walk Avenue and LaSalle Street. Item 10 is Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission Annual Report. Item 11 is Contract SR58 Cured in Place Pipe Installation and Manhole Rehabilitation Project 2014. Item 12 is 2013 Recreation Advisory Commission Annual Report. Items 14 through 16 are items that can be found on the general business agenda of public hearings. <coughs> Item 19 is Tiger which is Transportation Investment <coughs> Generating Economic Recovery, FY 2014 Planning Grant Application. Uh, entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda with the exception of item seven. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? We'll close the vote. It passes seven to zero. We move to the general business agenda for public hearings. Item 14 is amendment to the economic incentive contract with the Gentian Group LLC for the Hotel Durham, known as the Holland Hotel Project. Uh, this is a public hearing on this item. Uh, any comments, questions by members of the council? Any comments, questions by members of the public that would like to speak on this item? All right, Thomas Leather's Office of Economic and Workforce Development, Mr. Mayor, Ms. Mayor Pro Tem, City Council Member, City Manager, and City Attorney. Uh, staff recommends that the City Council authorize the City Manager to enter into an amendment to their agreement with the Gentian Group for that would extend the terms of Section 3.11 of the original agreement by amending the date to secure a final certificate of compliance to no later than April the 30th and to hold a public hearing. Yeah, this is a public hearing. You've heard the staff report. I would ask are there any questions by council of the staff? Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had a, just a question about the specifics of this. I, I can see that we're allowing them more time, but there, there was one thing I couldn't quite understand, which was what does the change to the $400,000 signify? A change from what? I didn't really quite understand that. And, what, also, I couldn't quite understand what kicks in when that $400,000 threshold is met. 
right? The 400,000 was the amount of the certificate of inspections, the inspection certificate that the developer had at the time of the agreement. Um, because the agreement was delayed due to the public hearings and the public charrettes uh, associated with the right-of-way proposal and the, um, and the easement that the council passed in December, the developer was not able to proceed with his plans for the development. So the $400,000 represents the encumbered amount that the it, that developer had expended in, in good faith efforts for the development agreement. And so that has previously been expended? Yes, the developer has secured uh, inspections for uh, $400,000. And it was my sense, and I, I'm sorry I'm confused about this, I didn't quite understand, is this different it, it, have they now, is, is that $400,000 now kick in over some threshold that, that previously something else was going to have to be required for? I, I just wasn't right. quite clear about that. In the original agreement, um, the certificate of the inspection um, was supposed to be 25% of the minimal capital investment for the entire project. With, as the developer proceeded to initiate the development, um, the 400000 was secured, so that is currently secured. There will be additional certificates of inspection that will be, um, that's, that the development will secure going forward based on the delays. So this does not in any way, there, there's no, uh, in terms of, there's no uh, increased liability, lack of security, anything like that that we would be None at all. The city would not face any liability right. or any and additional our, threats. Our, our incentive doesn't kick in until they're done and ready and as That's usual. correct. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks. I was confused about that, and I appreciate the clarification. You're welcome. Are there further questions from members of the council? Again, this is a public hearing. Is anyone in the public that would like to speak on this item, either for or against? Uh, let the record reflect no one in the public asked to speak on this item. I will declare the public hearing to be closed. Matter of fact, for the council. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Move to item 15, proposed economic development incentive agreement with Austin Lawrence Partners East LLC for capital investments and architectural elements at 119 West Paris Street, 113 West Paris Street, 118 West Main Street, 120 West Main Street, 122 West Main Street, and 202 North Cochran, Cochran Street. Again, this is a public hearing. Would ask uh, Economic Development Director Kevin Dick. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, City Council, City Administration, and uh, Durham residents. I'm Kevin Dick with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development, and I'm here this evening to discuss a proposed economic development incentive uh, with Austin between the City of Durham and Austin Lawrence Partners East. Uh, the presentation tonight will come in uh, two parts. Um, I will go through a brief overview and review of the project and address a um, specific question uh, related to contracting goals that um, uh, arose at the uh, March 20th work session and in subsequent discussions with council on the project. And <clears throat> the developer is also present and will address further questions uh, related to uh, different aspects of the development. Before I continue, however, I do want to acknowledge um, the efforts of, of many city staff who have brought the project to this point. Um, and um, in particular, I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of Thomas Leathers, David Boyd, Keith Herman, and Fred Lamar. We've all worked very hard to bring the project to this point, and um, although I'm making the presentation, I'm making it on their behalf um, as well. Uh, <clears throat> By way of review, the project, the city center in Jack Tar, our redevelopment project, is um, in, in two uh, central parts. One part is a 26-story mixed-use tower, uh, literally uh, in the center of downtown. That would be at 119 West Paris Street. Also involved is the restoration, as the mayor indicated earlier, of four addresses within the city center, 113 West Paris Street, 118, 120, and 122 West Main Street. Um, further, the redevelopment of the Jack Tar Hotel is proposed at 202 Corcoran Street, which would convert that facility from a 44 to 74 room hotel and also rehabilitate a 200 space 
excuse me, 260 space parking deck. The city center tower is proposed to consist of two levels of subgrade parking, ground floor retail, four floors of office space, 20 floors of apartments, and rooftop amenities. Uh, in all, in all uh, the project at the city center would have uh, roughly 424,000 square feet of total space. That would include 145,000 square feet of office and commercial, and also maintain architectural elements at four addresses that are slated for rehabilitation. The Jack Tar phase of the project would consist of 14,000 square feet of retail, 32,000 square feet of hotel space, and over 110,000 square feet of public parking with 50 spaces for general public use. In terms of project benefits, we anticipate the city uh, accruing um, over 8.3 million in new tax revenues that would consist of property taxes, sales taxes, and occupancy taxes. That would yield a $4.3 million net revenue gain uh, once incentives would be paid out. The proposed incentive is, th is uh, 3.9 million uh, over 15 years. And uh, as we uh, all may be aware, the county is proposing a similar incentive um, that would essentially match what the city is proposing to provide and um, believe the county is slated to um, discuss this in a, a, a public hearing and approve an agreement on April 28th. Uh, in terms of jobs benefits, 585 jobs, which would yield increased permanent foot traffic in, the, uh, in downtown, and that includes roughly 325 new jobs. There would be 250 temporary construction jobs and $65 million in qualified capital investment. Other project benefits include the fact that new opportunities for the NC Works Career Center, formerly the Durham Job Link, um, it's been recently renamed by the governor. Uh, new opportunities will be created for individuals who are registered with that system. And as we've done with other projects, we will be connecting the uh, developer with um, our resources to um, help Durham residents um, have the opportunities to be placed in, in some of these new jobs. There would also be new opportunities for Durham-based firms, including Durham-based small and disadvantaged business enterprises. Um, we are proposing a goal that has been agreed, uh, agreed upon with the developer of a 15% for Durham-based businesses to include 5% uh, for Durham-based small, small and disadvantaged business enterprises. And those goals were derived uh, collectively and collaboratively uh, between the Office of Economic and Workforce Development and the Equal Opportunity and Equity Assurance Office uh, based upon um, uh, 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 ongoing methodology that EOEA uses to determine goals for projects. The um, one thing I would also like to bring to your attention um, is uh, section 3.1.1 of the agreement. Um, that's been modified slightly uh, since the April 10th work session. And the proposed change to that is that the commencement, um, and the developer will go into more detail um, related to this aspect, but that the commencement date of the project um, would consist of, uh, or um, adherent, adherence to the commencement date of the project would consist of two parts. Um, applying for at least $300,000 in permits no later than September 1st, and applying for uh, an amount cumulative up to $1.5 million, so including the initial $300,000, by January 1st. And what the applications for permits will allow, and once they're approved, is the developer to begin um, shoring up the facade and interior walls that will enable them to clean out debris at the, uh, uh, behind the wall of the, the burned out building at 117 uh, West Paris Street. And um, at this point, I'm going to turn over the rest of the presentation um, to the developer and they'll continue with specific aspects related to um, how they intend to carry out the development. Um, but I can take questions at this time or at the end. Well, let me ask other questions. But recognize the mayor pro tem. I, um, Kevin, I have a question about the 15% goal for Durham-based businesses, uh, including the 5% SDB. Have, have you outlined or designated what those businesses 
are, what, what kinds of business is needed, contracts are needed on this? Yes, ma'am. Um, they include construction-related trades as well as professional services. So architecture, engineering, um, you know, and, and various uh, construction-related trades, electrical contracting, uh, plumbing, um, uh, drywall work, those kinds of things. Okay. At, at, at what juncture, so at some point in the future, if we requested to see those businesses, we could see those? businesses that are on that contract? The, the, the specific businesses yes. that have been contracted? Yes. yes. Okay. The developer will re be required to submit quarterly reports, and we can certainly bring those back okay. um, to council. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's all, Mr. All right. Any other questions from a member of the council? If not, Hi, my name is Greg Hills. I'm managing partner for Austin Lawrence Partners East. Uh, I want to thank Mayor Bell, uh, the members of the council, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Tom Bomfield, Kevin, for his very eloquent uh, explanation of our project. Uh, I'll be the guy here with the pretty pictures. Um, as, as Kevin uh, stated, uh, we have two projects that uh, we're coming uh, in front of you for to consider for a public-private partnership, and we very much appreciate that. Um, one is the city center, 26-story building. The other one is the Jock Tar. I'll give you a quick overview um, of the project, our timeline, which I'm sure you're very interested in, how we see the benefits, um, the financial scope, and I'm here to answer any of your questions. Um, City Center, the tall building there, 26 stories, mixed-use project, um, located at Corcoran between Maine and Parrish. Um, it is um, designed to bring energy to that area of town um, with the retail, 25,000 feet, the 120,000 square feet of office, and 20 st stories of residential. Um, it will, um, uh, this is the corner of um, what it would look like at Corcoran and Parrish. Just another pretty pictures of what it will look like. We are also um, restoring five facades. Um, we've gone through historic uh, HPC uh, certificate of appropriateness um, to, um, you know, we feel strongly about trying to restore um, these facades, the facades are in very poor condition, three on Main, two on Parish. Um, the buildings have been altered significantly from where they were uh, 100 years ago. We plan to restore them back to what they looked like uh, originally, so they'll be a lot better looking than they are today. Um, they are going to be just a facade. Um, we are planning to tear the buildings behind the facade down and build the brand new structure uh, behind these facades. They'll be restored and they're gonna look like they always were there. Um, we're gonna combine the old historic buildings with the new uh, flavor of the contemporary structure. Uh, we've done a number of these projects in other areas, uh, latest uh, in Aspen, Colorado. Um, they also are very uh, sensitive to restoring and paying tribute to the past. Um, and uh, we feel very strongly about doing the same thing. It is expensive, uh, it does take time, it's a logistical issue to, to deal with, but we like to feel that we've held on to our uh, historical roots. Um, as, a, as Kevin very eloquently stated, we're gonna have two levels of parking below grade for city center, 25,000 square feet of retail, 120,000 feet of office, uh, of which Duke University is committed to at least 55,000 feet in the building and 20 stories of uh, residential. Um, philosophically, we feel that's the best uh, uh, project for downtown Durham because it brings bodies that you would want here during the day in terms of the retail and the office. 
and then it also act, helps activate a nighttime lifestyle in terms of people going to restaurants, also be here on weekends. So we feel having a mis mixed use project is a very important component to reactivate the energy of downtown Durham. Um, timeline, um, our timeline uh, is to hopefully achieve uh, consent uh, between the city and the county on the public-private partnership uh, during the month of April. We expect to get site plan approval um, uh, from the city. We've, uh, this, we're on our uh, third iteration. It should be a final iteration of the site plan. Uh, we expect to have that approval in the month of May. We are uh, going to our second phase of document uh, design it's called the, uh, the uh, design development of these documents, um, the DD phase. That'll be done on uh, May 1. Once you're done with that phase, you reprice the project, and then you go on to your construction document phase. Um, so we expect to have our construction documents uh, completed uh, by the end of August. Um, in terms of financing, we are uh, uh, working with our financing partner. It's a REIT. Um, out of Virginia uh, that is very interested in, in being our, our financing partner on the project. Uh, we're expecting their term sheet from them like, tomorrow um, and hope to have that completed in total document phase in the month of September. Uh, we then expect to pull uh, our first permits, uh, which would be our demo permits in early in October. Um, get commencement of work based upon that work will start once we have final uh, uh, shoring and uh, foundation permits from the city. So sometime we're hoping in the fourth quarter of, uh, of this year to be uh, actually seeing work going on um, and, and then deliver the building in the fall of 2016. Um, the Jack Tar building uh, is a building that uh, um, at first I wasn't sure about the building quite honestly um, as to what to do with it. Uh, uh, over time I've fallen in love with uh, the building um, and um, uh, we would like to restore uh, the parking and what is parked in that deck and realizes that it could use a little brightening up and better lighting and access. Uh, um, and so we plan to restore the parking. Uh, we'll use a couple hundred of those spaces for the city center overflow parking, um, as well as uh, parking for the public. Um, the building itself, the, the hotel, it's a mixed-use building, 14,000 square feet of retail, has about 14,000 feet of office, and then 44 hotel rooms. Um, it's uh, marginally occupied uh, right now. Um, there are a lot of communities that are looking at these buildings today, these post-war modern buildings as a significant part of their history. Some people feel they should be raised, other people feel they're an important part of the history and need to be preserved. Um, we're in the camp that we feel they do represent an important part of history and we'd like to preserve it. Um, we think the best use is for it to be a uh, hotel, uh, bottom floor retail, um, and a limited service, moderately priced uh, hotel. Uh, we like to, we call it sort of a hip, or artsy, cool uh, place to, to spend an evening or, or spend time on the third floor deck. Um, the deck, as you know, has a pool. Uh, we would like to uh, reactivate that pool, maybe not that pool, um, but uh, uh, Please. Uh, but a, a, another pool um, so that uh, at the end of your city council meeting you would think you'd want to go over there and have a drink. So uh, it would be open to the guest uh, of the hotel as well as um, to the public. Um, so it's a little bit of a view of the deck itself, concepts of um, having maybe ability to show a film up there for Film Fest. Uh, again, a great place to gather, sit by a pool, have a drink, um, enjoy your you know, friends and, and whatnot. Um, the parking deck has approximately 250, 260 parking spaces that we want to obviously uh, reactivate. Um, 
and make it much more appealing to park there for both the public as well as um, um, hotel guests and uh, city center users. Uh, retail, um, 14,000 feet, we'll probably have a couple of restaurants there. We think there's an interesting opportunity with uh, Parish Street having, uh, owning both sides of part of that street. We think the history of Parish Street is very important. We've had a number of conversations about that subject. Uh, we don't have our vision identified for Parish Street, but we think there's an opportunity to pay tribute to the historical nature of Black Wall Street and re-engage it. Uh, I think initially we think a, a better concept would be to make that street feel a little bit different than a lot of the other streets in Durham. So the fact that we would be a stakeholder on both sides, we have an opportunity to help with our part as well as a number of other stakeholders there uh, as well. Um, uh, as I said, we'll have retail, we're gonna have 74 hotel rooms. Um, time frame on the Jack Tar. Again, we hope that the public-private partnership will be approved this month. Um, we'll have our schematics uh, finished in July. Uh, we'll uh, submit our major submittals to HPC SHPO and site plan in July. We will um, hopefully have approvals in a couple of months in September. Uh, we'll start our construction documents in September. Um, uh, we'll have our financing all finalized by the end of the year and we'll start in early January and want to open the hotel in the spring of 2016. We'll be starting slightly later than the city center project but we will be opening sooner than the city center project, um, but we want them to go about at the same pace. Um, um, in terms of, as, as Kevin was outlining, we hope the, that the community will feel there are significant benefits to our project, um, not just in construction jobs and people that are gonna be living, working, playing in these uh, two developments. Um, we think there's a, a significant opportunity for local trades to participate in the building of this of these projects, uh, our contractor is here, and they they have a um, uh, history and reputation of, of of hiring local trades, and prefer to hire local trades as much as possible. Um, um, we think the benefits of the project are uh, helping to revitalize, transform an area of downtown. Uh, Obviously, our site is part of the, the you know, let's say, not say blight is the right word, but maybe the lack of appeal. So if we can just, you know, do something with our buildings, um, that'll help with the center core. So we help, we think that it will help revitalize the downtown by having very significant development. The combination of 21C and our project, uh, we think will be a very powerful combination for downtown Durham. Um, preserving historic assets, uh, we think that's a, 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 a good thing to do for a community, both in the, the five facades as well as the Jack Tar. Um, it will help to increase the, the population within the city, downtown, both day and night, um, which will help a number of, of folks. Um, we think it's going to in, uh, induce uh, other stakeholders in the area to improve their buildings, um, to uh, rev help revitalize downtown. Uh, We'll be adding to the inventory a Class A office space, which uh, I know that Durham uh, definitely could use. Um, we feel that the downtown area, even though there are beds, hot beds coming to downtown, it's always good to have a mix of types of hot beds coming to downtown. We think the Jack Tar will offer, offer an opportunity on the, what would be considered the lower end of the, the price point for a hotel room. Um, we'll be adding and upgrading parking for uh, locals. Um, and so uh, we think that this project is, is a, a project that uh, we're going to invest, you know, probably somewhere north of $85 million between the two projects, uh, between debt and equity. Um, and so we're hopeful that uh, between the city and the county that uh, they'll want to participate in a public-private partnership to about 7% of what we're investing. Um, the tax uh, increase um, uh, between what those two assets are doing today, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of between the two, or I think for the city, it's around $18,000 a year. 
we project that those two assets should generate almost $600,000 a year of taxable income once we're up and running. So, so we think it's a, it's, a, it's a project that I think at the end of the day, the, the city will be very proud of. We think it will create great jobs. We think it will offer an inventory of, of retail, office, and, and residential for the community that doesn't exist today. Um, and we're hopeful that uh, you'll um, feel the same way. So we're also here to answer any questions that you might have, so. Well, th thanks again for, um, first of all, your, your interest in Durham, and more particularly your investment in Durham, potential investment in Durham. Uh, this is still a public hearing. I, I want to find out first, are there questions from members of the council, or either Kevin or the developer? And I, I have some questions, but I, I'll wait. If not, we have people in the public who've indicated they'd like to speak, and I'd okay. like to recognize them at this time. Um, Jeff Durham, I saw Jeff. Shelley Green, Casey Steinbacher, Andrea Harris, and Gray Brooks. Uh, if you could limit your comments to uh, three minutes, please. And the timer is over to your right in front of you. Very well. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam mm -hmm. Mayor Pro Temp, members of the City Council. Uh, City Administration, thank you very much. My name is Jeff Durham. I'm with uh, Downtown Durham, Inc., and uh, here to support our uh, project for uh, Center City and Jack Tar, as pre presented by our partners at uh, Austin Lawrence. Um, we believe that the project will, in fact, have a transformative effect on the surrounding Center City District. Uh, I think the positive effects of this development will allow for the nearby property owners to potentially capitalize by future uh, redevelopment of their site um, into higher and better uses. Um, we also believe the project will literally serve as a beacon uh, to visitors to downtown, many of you may be unaware of all the dining and entertainment options uh, that, are that exist right now currently inside of the loop. It's in this regard that the activity generated for this project will greatly improve the pedestrian connectivity in between the downtown districts. The project respects the street level, level engagement with the ground floor restaurant and retail activity. Very importantly, we think the project is consistent with the goals of the downtown master plan for a multi-story mixed-use development in the center city district. First, the master plan identifies the need for continued partnerships with public sector investment in order to better encourage private sector developments. Second, the project is a good deal for the taxpayer and that the returns on the completed project far exceed the initial public investment and no funds will be dispersed until the project is open for business and generating revenues. Third, the downtown master plan identifies increased residential population as a critical contributor to the continuing success of downtown. The plan calls for an additional 5,000 downtown residential units and this project contributes to that number greatly. From a residential and lodging standpoint, the increased number of residents and visitors will help diversify our local tax base, which is currently dominated by the commercial markets. Center City residents and Jack Tar visitors alike will provide a crucial market segment beyond just the employees from day to day. It is this market which will support existing merchants and drive demand for additional dining, retail, and entertainment options. From the standpoint of the commercial end, the office component does indeed provide additional inventory to the much needed Class A market sector, as Greg uh, mentioned earlier. This additional Class A space provides recruitment opportunities for new businesses and retention opportunities for expanding businesses that are already downtown. And lastly, from that retail standpoint, the Center City Project does plan to save those five facades in addition to upgrading the existing 14,000 that are on uh, the ground floor of the Jack Tar Hotel. While all these, pro these projects are indeed uh, complex and they're very, very ambitious, um, they did require a great deal of creativity, problem solving, and dedicating from all sides. Um, this is one of my first projects here in Durham, and it was a real privilege to, and I certainly do appreciate uh, the partnership that's involved in working with both teams from the public and private sector. So thank you all very much. You're welcome. Uh, next, Shelley Green. Good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. I'd like to speak about the hotel portion of this particular project. I'm Shelley Green. I'm president of the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau. And I know this council has been very, very generous, um, particularly in offering incentives for hotel projects in our downtown area. And it's essentially offsetting a small portion of those projects so that they can happen. And I know some of you have asked the question, so when is enough? Are we there yet? 
And I would suggest to you we're not quite there yet. Um, we did a study in 2007 and 8 looking at where parity lies with our competitive set of cities. And the hotel number at that point was about 1,200 rooms. And we have not redone that because there hasn't been a lot of building of hotel rooms through this recession. Uh, we've got 200 right now. We've got 450 on the books, 450 rooms. So that puts us at about halfway, in my opinion. Um, but that's not why I think this is a good project. Um, I, I th I'm thankful that a lot of these additional hotel rooms that will come will not need incentives, we hope. Um, but I've spoken with the developers, and I really believe that this hotel is going to fill a niche that is really an important pricing point. Uh, because this hotel could be, and nobody's published rates yet, but you look at some of the luxury market hotel rooms coming in, this could be as much as $100 less per night. And that's going to appeal to a lot of visitors that may not be able to stay in a 21C. Uh, and it's going to really appeal to conventions. Um, so I think having this piece of the pie is going to be really important. But incentives like this don't just help create jobs, and those are certainly important, but there's a value added when you have a hotel because you're going to have about 150 people every single day in that hotel that are going to be spending money in our restaurants, entertainment venues, our retail stores, our gas stations. There's a lot of places that they're going to spend money. And that, of course, generates additional tax revenue for the city and the county. So, as my board member, Cora Cole McFadden, says, it's not just about raising property taxes. It's about generating revenue. And I think that this project can really do it. So I'd like to offer my support. And I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Casey Steinbacher. Mayor, Mo Mayor Pro Tem, good council members, good evening. My name is Casey Steinbacher. I'm president and CEO of the Greater Durham Chamber of Commerce. Um, the last Wednesday night, I went to the men, Duke's men's basketball banquet. Um, and at that banquet, uh, Coach K always has a kind of um, uh, uh, tradition in which the seniors always get to speak. And so the first, there were four seniors this year. The first three came up, and uh, they all had their notes and their note papers in front of them and, the, and spoke eloquently. Um, the fourth senior came up and uh, he walked up without a piece of paper and he set his hands on the counter and he says, I know my counterparts had speeches and note cards prepared, but it is 2014 and I brought my iPhone. Uh, so I thought I would do that this evening as well until I realized I forgot my eyeglasses. So instead, <laughs> being the old woman that I am, uh, the Greater Durham Chamber of Commerce doesn't always get actively involved in downtown development projects. We leave that to our partner economic development organization, Downtown Durham Inc., and once again have done a fabulous job. Uh, but the Chamber got involved in this project because we believe it is absolutely a transformational opportunity for Durham. Um, it is a phenomenal project um, that in, in so many ways, not the least of which, uh, from our perspective, uh, two really important things. You heard a lot about all that's going on in that project. One that I really want to stress that may um, not be as obvious, and that is the incredible density that we start to create in downtown Durham. Um, density is critically important from the Chamber's perspective if we're ever going to get to the numbers that we need to get to for all of our transit um, and, and uh, related needs that we have in downtown Durham. So the idea that we start to create a very dense environment downtown uh, is a really positive thing for our live, work, learn, play activity for our sustainability issues and for our transit issues. Second piece that I want to emphasize on behalf of the Durham Chamber is the Class A office space. You heard uh, earlier in the presentation um, that it is much needed in Durham, and it is. Um, we, the only Class A office space we have in Durham on a regular basis is spec, speculative kind of office space. And it's very difficult from us, for us as we go out and talk to uh, prospects interested in coming to Durham to be able to tell them that we have potential opportunities for Class A office space, but none sitting there ready or in the process of getting ready. Um, and we actively are asked uh, to bid on projects that involve Class A office space. And we're very, very limited throughout all of Durham County, not just downtown and not just the city of Durham. So we're very anxious and excited to have this kind of um, inventory coming on the shelf for us. We're very confident that we're going to be able to, to use that to Durham's benefit. So um, all the other issues, all the other um, 
uh, uh, proponents that you've heard from have uh, spoke more eloquently on the other pieces. Uh, the Durham Chamber strongly supports this, and we're really looking forward to uh, working with the developers on this one. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Uh, Andrea Harris. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Andrea Harris with the Institute of Minority Economic Development. I live every day on Parish Street at 114, 116 West Parish Street. And we've been there now for about 15 years, so I've watched um, the street come to life. I've also watched the building that was burned about 10 years ago as it further deteriorated and as expectations of owners changed, as people no longer looked like me and standards went down. I've also watched the Parish Street Fund come and go. And so at this point, I must say that I celebrate uh, the, this development. Um, rarely do you have a developer come to you and say, we're willing to work with you, we want to make sure that the minority women's business community participates in this project, whether it's around supplies, uh, professional services, construction. Uh, we will utilize your plans room. We want to make sure that in constructing this building, we still construct it in a way that you all still have some sunlight. Uh, who also, you know, were willing to design the building in such a way that the parking's in the building and that Parish Street didn't become a service alleyway, but, you know, we're willing to commit to trying to bring back the significance. And, and I think it's welcoming to have that kind of partnership. And rarely do you have this level of potential investment in the downtown. So I just wanted to say, you know, we welcome this, we welcome this partnership, and we hope that as you work towards um, clearly having a positive response to this development, that you also work towards reinvigorating the Parish Street Fund and also helping with some of the other repairs that need to be made on Parish Street. Thank you. Dre Brooks. Mayor, City Council, thank you guys for your time. Uh, I'm Gray Brooks. I'm the owner of Pizzeria Toro, um, or one of, the, one of the owners of it. Uh, soon, I promise, <laughs> to answer that question. Uh, I, I'm, I love this project. Um, I just want to say quick, I, I uh, obviously, if just being purely selfish, the density is great for us. But if I was selfish, I wouldn't have moved back to Durham. I could have opened a restaurant in Seattle and it had been like Saturday night every single night. But I had the fortune of living in Seattle uh, from the time, about 15 years, from the time where Durham was about six, seven years ago to where I think we hope to be in about 10 years. And when I saw that happening here, I really wanted to come back here and be part of it. It's my hometown. I love this place. and and, and Watching it turn around, I wanted to be here. I wanted to be part of that happening. And uh, one of the things I noticed in Seattle, uh, there are sort of almost two Seattles in the downtown area. Uh, one developed retail really heavily, and one did not. And the one that developed retail heavily just boomed. Uh, property value went up, rent went up, revenue drivers went up. People started coming there for what was happening there. And I think, to me, what's most exciting about this really is all the retail space. Because the, when my wife and I have a, a Saturday off together, which does occasionally happen even when we are open, not often, like one of my problems with downtown Durham is that there's still, on the ground floor of all the retail spaces around town, there's still too, many, too much office space. Um, I, I do love attorneys. Um, <laughs> but when, when my wife and I have a day off. She wants to go to Hillsboro or Pittsburgh and we'll get something to eat and she likes to go look at shoes or, and we go look at clothes or I go look at electronic shops. We don't say, let's, after lunch, let's go in this law office and check out their case files. <laughs> that's, and, and, and I think that's a big deal because right now people will come here. They'll, people from Raleigh and Cary and Chapel Hill, they'll come here to go to Toro or they'll come here to go to Mateo or come, come here to check out Vert and Vogue. But they don't really say, the way to do for Hillsborough or Pittsburgh, they don't really say, hey, let's go spend the afternoon in Durham. And I think that's our next step, is to make Durham a place where people, they don't come with a particular business in mind, they just come to walk around. We, people who live here are great, but we all live here. We're going to spend our money here. I, I really want to see people from Raleigh and Cary and Chapel Hill come here more just to check out the city and, and wander around and see what's going on. I think that's, to me, that's what's most exciting about this project. and, and I think most of the people who do what I do, if they knew what was going on, if they had the time that I have now to follow this stuff, they would uh, absolutely be on board with me. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. 
let, let me ask before I come back to the council, is there anyone else in the public that wants to speak on this item before I close it? Okay. Um, <clears throat> recognize members of the council who may have comments. I have a couple comments myself, and I'll withhold mine. Uh, I recognize Councilman Davis, Councilman Brown, Councilman Shule. Mayor Pro Tem, in that order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I would like to ask the developers if there's been dialogue and conversation uh, with the current business owners about uh, the potential of what may be coming. Um, have they been kept abreast of uh, where they may fall into this whole concept? Um, yes, yes and no. Yes, from the standpoint we had a, a meeting of um, uh, the PAC-5 group in downtown Durham was, I would say, 100, 120 folks were at, at Carmack and the gallery, and we talked about what we were doing and the, and the concept um, and listened to a lot of their questions and comments, and, and a lot of those points were very well taken and actually incorporated some of them some actually on environmental, so we really thought more about the environmental impacts of our, uh, of our, our project. So, so yes, we did talk to them about what we were gonna do. Um, have we done a good job since then as to what we're doing? I would say no. Um, um, and as we've been busy sort of moving the project forward and trying to uh, uh, work with the city and the county on this part of the, the project. We have talked to at uh, um, Jack Tar, uh, to Gwen at uh, Blue Moon Cafe, and um, and so uh, Blue Cafe, excuse me, and um, and talked to her about whether her, her interest would be in terms of staying. We have a diner concept that maybe she had an interest in, and so we were going to meet this week. So I've definitely kept in good contact with her. Um, in terms of going forward, we actually plan to have a person that's part of our group to. Uh, communicate with the local businesses as to what we're doing, the construction management plan, interruption, and that kind of a thing. In terms of our, our retail concepts, we haven't defined them right now well enough to say, gee, we really want you in here and you in here. That we have not done yet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, recognize Councilman Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Greg, thanks for your your comments, and we're, we're very pleased that uh, you and your family yeah. are here this evening. And I want to thank those who spoke on behalf of this project as well. Uh, as you know, at our, I guess it was April 10th meeting, uh, the, the council, and I did hear from Paul, and thank you for that, expressed some concerns about the, uh, the facade on Parish Street and the fact that it's been there really for for too long and i was wondering if you could have your contractor come up and uh, address those issues to reassure us that uh, that this will be done sure. I wanted to guess. hello i'm amanda moreau i'm with hit contracting the contractor for the project thank you so much for allowing me to um, speak to this topic uh, we are very excited and um, we do have uh, preliminary plans as far as the way that we see the structural reinforcement of the existing facades to make sure that they are um, maintained structurally while we demo out the building that is behind them now. And then, of course, restoring them to the beauty that they were 100 years ago. That is the plan, as Greg mentioned earlier. So. Um, did we send over the, uh, we did send over, I don't know if you all have it available, but we had mock, did a mock-up um, visual of uh, the plan for reinforcing the structure. It would be to install some uh, steel reinforcements, um, basically supporting them from the street side and then on the back side of the facades also so that there would be bracing. And then when we remove um, the existing structure for demo, everything basically is structurally sound, we're not worried about anything caving in, it's not a safety issue, and then as we excavate, we are um, shoring the dirt and uh, we've got underpinning um, and soil nails is kind of the plan right now so that everything is 
kept where it's supposed to be and none of the buildings that are adjacent have any issues. Yeah. And, uh, uh, two other points. One, I think, Paul, in your message, uh, and Amanda, I think you obviously will concur with this, that it is not a good idea to remove the debris first. Not at all, no. We are um, pretty adamant that it should just remain the way that it is. If we were to go in and remove the debris that's there now without putting in um, the re reinforcements and doing the full demo, we essentially have to rebuild the structure so that we can go in and take out the, the de debris that you can't see so that it's safe for people to go in there. We certainly don't want to create any issues of safety. So we would recommend that uh, because the structure is sound, even though it's a little bit unsightly right now, and I know everyone can't wait for it to be beautiful again, uh, that just kind of hold on for a few more months until we can get that bracing in place, do the demo and continue with the project so that way it's safe, we don't have security issues and we don't have to spend money that really is just gonna be torn back out in a couple of months. And also with your future plans mm -hmm. for these buildings, uh, they would coincide with the existing height? The, the facade, the facade. The facade stays um, the existing height. It would be, we will um, keep the materials there that are sound that we can just kind of clean up and, and restore them, um, whatever is existing. Where we need to replace materials, where it's, um, there's a lot of deterioration, especially on uh, the building where the fire was and it's, there's whole sections that are missing from that facade. We will have custom materials made that will match what should be there. So when, when it's all done, it'll be a seamless look um, as far as what was there initially. We are very excited about it. Okay. So are you telling us you, you may exceed the height of the original facades, but it will be an identical match? Um, the height of the original facade would stay the same. We're not, we shouldn't be exceeding at That's the historical facades. They, they will stay the same height at that portion. Right. Okay, and finally, Amanda, could you give us the, uh, the calendar again, the time frame? The time frame? We're looking to start this um, once we've got the demolition permit and start in October would be ideal um, so that we could start bracing up that structure, do the demo. Once we've got all that existing structure um, out of the way, we basically would go right into the earthwork phase and start digging down so that we can build back up again. So we've got to go down for those two levels of below grade parking and then come up to grade and then we'll go up from there. Okay. Thank you. And I just okay. have, uh, thank you, thank you, Amanda. And I just have a few questions for, for Greg. Uh, could you be a little more insightful in terms of the financing? Because I didn't, is it, did you say REIT out of Virginia? REIT, a REIT, a real estate investment trust. Okay. And that's out of Virginia. Yes. And obviously you would not be here tonight with your family unless your preliminary discussions with them uh, appear to be very positive. That's you know, totally. I mean, we've, to give you some context, you know, we paid $3 million and closed on that piece of land. We spent another $2 million to get to this point. So we've invested cash of about $5 million already into this project. And so if we didn't feel we could make this work, we never would have made that investment. So that's one. Two, the financing markets are a lot different right now than they were a year ago, two years ago. You know, sure. the green fire days of 2008 when everything yeah. imploded. It is much, it's not an easy process. Banks are not easy or REITs are not easy to deal with. But they have a lot of money to place and they want to place it. And Durham is a place they would like to place it. Not everybody, but a lot of them want to invest in Durham. So. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, again, thanks for your insight. Let me uh, conclude with a somewhat minor point. Uh, I, I like it when you said you had fallen in love with a jack tar. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but on the other hand, uh, you used a phrase that uh, I would suggest perhaps you don't want to use again, and that is, uh, bringing bodies to uh, bringing bodies to downtown Durham. 
okay. uh, that has some negative connotations to it. Uh, and indeed, perhaps 30 or 40 years ago, particularly after 5 p.m., uh, some people may have referenced Durham as being a morgue, oh. but, uh, but no more. So, okay. so live br bodies. Bringing, br bringing live bodies, or more importantly, bringing yeah. people and citizens yes. uh, is a better way of perhaps yeah. phrasing that. I will phrase it more carefully next time. I apologize. Uh, thank you so much. We we're glad all of you are here. You recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation and um, for the comments from everybody. Um, it was really good to see the moved up timeline on the uh, for pulling the permits and appreciate you all working on that. And I, I feel a lot more comfortable about that. Um, and also, I, I it was good to get the the the, uh, the photographs of the facades, which I had seen before, I realize, and but appreciated seeing again. And um, I know that uh, they are not going to look exactly like that, but it, but I appreciated the uh, I appreciated getting that and, and understanding that better. And I do think it will be walkable, and I think that's really really important. Um, so a few questions, and um, maybe some of these are actually for uh, Kevin. I guess this first one, um, wherever he is. Hey, Kevin. Uh, the Corcoran Street parking deck has 260 spaces, 210 of which are slated for use by the developer for the hotel or the city center, city center commercial clients. Uh, what's the current situation with that parking deck? How many of those spaces are used on a daily basis and what will be the options for people who park there now? Um, I do not have those numbers um, with me exactly. Um, and I, I think we can get them to you, but I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure this, the, the daily uses requirements. Um, they do not approach the, the numbers and, and the scale that we would expect to happen um, with this development there. Yeah, but this is, this is not our deck. No, this is, it's, this a pri it's a private right. deck. And so yeah. I assume they have some, you know, they have some contractual relationship and, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in do we know anything about those people and what the plans are? You're assuming you're, I'm sorry, you assume that I'm assuming the that there are people parking there now who aren't going to be able to park there in the future and I'm, I'm interested in, do we know anything about that? Uh, we, don't, we don't know exactly what relationship they have with the, the current building owner, but um, you Maybe know, the developer they, they, could sure. comment? You have uh, currently a, a number of spaces being uh, used by the 21C construction folks in Skanska. Uh, you have the uh, Marriott uh, is leasing uh, month to month about 30 spaces. You have uh, about another 30 spaces in the building of office users um, that you know those you know that's going to be turned into retail, and then the rest of it is day to day parking. Um, come to town and you just okay. need to be there for a couple hours. So their alternative would be the Chapel Hill deck or Corcoran deck or, or even the space that we'll have within the building. Okay. Thank yeah. you. That's helpful. Okay. So not a lot of people in that situation then who have long-term contracts Could no, can no expect one does. something. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. And then also I think this is for you, Kevin. Um, on the project memo we just got for the Hotel Durham, it says it's creating 91 jobs. And the Jack Tar, it says, is going to create 10 hotel jobs with benefits for what's a larger hotel. Perhaps the difference is in the, the Hotel Durham job. Maybe that includes restaurant jobs or something as well. I wasn't sure. Yeah, that's but can correct. you explain the difference? It includes restaurant jobs, uh, hotel jobs. It's also considered a more specialty boutique hotel, which, which uh, may cause a different job mix than the Jack Tar Hotel would. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, and then... Uh, I'm interested in an estimate of how many of the 500 office jobs are going to be from, from relocation um, from Duke, uh, I assume. And, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering how many new jobs we, we think we're really talking about here as opposed to how many relocated jobs. And I was wondering if, I know you can't tell me that the exactly, but I wonder if you could give me some sense of it. The estimate is about 50% of each. Uh, 250 new and 250 uh, relocation. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. And that, 
I noticed that was about, the Duke it looked like it was taking about half the office space, so thank you. Um, on, on page seven of the memo, it gives an estimate of $3.4 million to the city over the period of the incentive in occupancy and retail sales taxes. Um, and can you, can you talk about how you develop an estimate like that in terms of the, it's, it's, of course it's mostly sales tax and less occupancy, but I wonder if you could talk to, talk to us about how you develop that estimate. Sure, um, that was derived from the hotel, so we weren't considering necessarily the retail sales and other aspects of the development. Okay. Um, we, uh, based upon uh, consultation with the Convention of Visitors Bureau, uh, determine some occupancy estimates over the life of the incentive and essentially what we did was stair step those percentages so we did a few years at 60 percent occupancy and then went to 62 64 and up to 68 um, percent by the end of the 15 years and so based upon that escalating occupancy we and uh, we were able to derive um, a, approximate taxes based upon the average uh, daily room rates um, and we came up with that $3.4 million figure. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. I noticed that the, the uh, it had been my understanding, I think perhaps from a discussion that I had with uh, Mr. Smith not long ago, that there were gonna be condos, and I, and I don't see any described here, is that, it's, 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 it's one point, I think you say 20, 20 floors of, of, of apartments, and then you, you said residential, uh, this is really curiosity as much as anything else and, and, and my interest in what the market's interested in. Uh, but I didn't see any condos in here and I was wondering if you could comment on that. There's, uh, there's a total of 132 residential units. Um, if, the, the market demand, if the market demand is strong enough, we're talking about six floors of condos. The top six floors, that'd be 23 units. Okay. and then 109 rental units. Okay. Um, the reason of the hesitancy is 2008. Hmm. Um, that in the event we're building this building and we think we're gonna be doing condos and 2000, an, an event happens. So now all of a sudden that market changes. Now it becomes an all rental building. We no longer have that component. If the world stays where it is now then it would probably would have six floors of condos, 23 units. Okay, thank you. Okay. The, um, the total private investment listed on the, the slide that we're looking at now is $85 million. Our memo, I believe, says $65 million, as a, as a, uh, but I, perhaps that was expressed as a minimum, but that's a big difference right. in those two numbers, and I wonder if you could talk about that. Sure. Uh, earlier in my presentation, I... I um, uh, referred to the 65 million as qualified capital investment. Uh -huh, I got we it. have specific types of capital mm -hmm. investment in our economic development policy that is considered qualified because it either directly relates to taxable, imp taxable improvements on a building or it constitutes certain um, what's known in the industry as soft costs that you know, correlate to, um, to construction. And so some of that, um, some of the, the delta between the 65 and 85 million are legal fees, um, different administrative fees okay. that would not correlate to those hard or soft costs that I referred to earlier. That's why there's a difference. Thank you, that's helpful. Oh. And the, the ratios in the memo, uh, Kevin, that you have for the different uh, projects, recent projects compared to this uh, Austin Lawrence project, um, is that based on the uh, on the qualified costs? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is really just a concern more than anything else, and I don't know that there's an answer to it. But um, uh, I've, I, I know I've, I've said this to uh, I've said this at city council before, and I'm not sure if if you all were there. But um, one concern I have is the disruption. Uh, the potential disruption of downtown during the fairly long period of time during which construction is going to take place. Uh, the, uh, I know it's a lot easier to renovate as, as the SunTrust building next door, but I think they've done an exceptionally good job of minimizing the disruption to downtown. You all have a much harder 
job ahead of you because you're building new, of course, and you're building something huge and so forth. But um, I wonder if you could, uh, you're experienced at this, and I wonder if, if, if uh, you could comment uh, on what you do to try to minimize disruption and any thoughts that you might have about that. So minimizing disruption is, of course, a priority for us. Um, one of the things that we have working in our benefit is with the Jack Tar project being across the street, that gives us uh, an additional area where we can use for storing materials and lay down and our parking uh, for the construction crews so that it's not congesting the area. We'll keep the site fencing um, really tight around the site so that we're not blocking off roadways and sidewalks. We'll be We'll build overhead protection, it'll be well lit, so there's security, so everything will stay as open as we can possibly safely do. So everything, of course, safety number one, um, we want to make sure that there's not any safety or security issues, but with that being said, we have experience um, really primarily at the D.C. area, there's nowhere to go. You can't block off a sidewalk, you can't block off the street, and we're very experienced with the logistics that come into play with that. So we are looking at all those options, um, and of course any of the plans that we have as far as any sidewalk closures, if when they need to happen, um, we'll be working very closely with the city to make sure that there aren't disruptions or that they're minimized. One of our other plans is as we get closer and throughout construction, we will um, we can put up a website which actually the community can log on to and see what's coming over the next few weeks. We can have kind of progress photos of what it's going to look like. Um, there's a lot of interesting technology now where we can model uh, the way it's going to look. So for people who aren't really familiar with construction, instead of it just being words on a page, they can see this is what you will see over the next few weeks. This is what the protected area will look like. This is what your path will look like. We might have to close off this street while we're doing utility work in the roadways, but this is how it will affect you. This is the time frame so that everyone is aware. Um, that's really what we've found has been uh, the biggest thing that minimizes um, aggravation from everyone is communication. So that's uh, one of the ways that we deal with that. We communicate um, often and try to stay open and um, we try to be good neighbors and touch base with everyone who's around the site to make sure that we are minimizing disruptions and hopefully throughout the course of construction the area businesses will see um, the restaurants around here, I mean, when I'm coming down, I'm so excited. I keep trying new places. They're amazing, and I know that hopefully they'll get a, a little bit of a burst um, as throughout the day people are going for lunch, and uh, we are excited about this one. So minimizing disruption is absolutely a priority for us. You'll like Pizza Toro also. <laughs> um, I haven't had anything I don't like around here. It's a great city. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That was helpful. Um, so... I just want to uh, echo uh, what one of the things that Eugene was saying, which is I appreciate that throughout this process uh, that, that uh, you all have been here for this and for our meetings and for the various hearings. It's, it's great to have Paul Smith here. He's an experienced person in Durham, and we know him well, and he's done a lot of good things. But it's, it's also good to see um, some of the principles, also other principles here, uh, that's to me, that's, that's meaningful. It means that you are paying the kind of attention that this needs, and um, it's been good to have you. Um, I'm, I, I like the, uh, I like the fact that, that in terms of our incentive, that this will be significantly revenue positive in the, in the uh, during the period of the incentive for the city and the taxpayer. Um, I do think it will be walkable, uh, which is important. Uh, I agree with you about the density uh, being uh, this, this will be, uh, Casey Steinbacher mentioned this, and, and uh, I think that it is an, definitely a benefit. Um, I think that if we don't build up, uh, as expensive as Durham is, is getting to, uh, relatively expensive as Durham is getting to live in, I think if we don't build up, we're just going to make Durham more expensive to live in. Uh, I do think that height is a, is a, is a benefit long term in terms of affordability for, um, for people to live downtown. So I think that there's really a lot to like here, and uh, I really appreciate you all bringing this project to us. I, I was really skeptical at the beginning, but I think that we're 
incentivizing the right things in terms of the, the uh, historical benefits. Um, and um, so uh, I'm definitely supportive and, and, and uh, looking forward to a uh, great new building downtown. Hope you all do it as well as you think you can. Thank you. Thank you. Let me recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Good evening. Uh, Amanda, I was excited before, but you have really <laughs> enhanced uh, my excitement about this project. Um, and thank you for uh, investing in my hometown. Um, the Jack Tar Hotel um, brings back some very fond memories. Um, I lived in a neighborhood located between the east and west campuses of Duke University and several of my neighbors actually worked at the Jack Tar Hotel. Hotel, Of course, a lot of change has changed since then, so I'm really glad to see you invest here. Um, the piece that is uh, very attractive to me is the additional rooms that we need downtown so that we can attract more meetings and conferences. I go to conferences all over the country. Well, not at the city's expense, but uh, I do go to conferences, and uh, we've been able to host a couple of small meetings here, but I'd like to see us bring much larger groups here. And just as uh, Shelley said, it will definitely uh, enhance revenue opportunities for the city as well. So thank you so much for choosing the city for this investment. I um, just have a couple of questions, and uh, I guess I wanted to sort of pick up on where Jean was to get a little bit more clarification on the financing piece. Uh, I, I saw the target that uh, you expect to have your financing be done by September of, mm -hmm. of this year, uh, and you're using real estate investment trusts as your. But I also heard you say that you were talking about apartments, but it might be condos. And uh, what what could be the downside of not being able to get to your financing? Uh, assuming the city and county makes this investment, I appreciate the investments you guys have made. What, what would be the downside of not being able to make that? I would that say date? first and foremost, it's a it's a um, sort of a national or an international event. Um, obviously, it's unforeseen, but those things happen, and it scares investors, scares people. They don't want to, you know, part with their money. They keep their money in their pocket and don't write checks and, and whatever. So. So if something of that significant, that is a risk. We can't control it. I, you know, if that happens, it happens. But um, you know, I would say it'd be that kind of event. Uh, short of that, uh, I'm not sure what would quite honestly happen. Having the Duke lease, having the city incentives and the county incentives, and having the pricing, unless Amanda can't give us the price that she says she can build it for, um, I'm not sure what Really, it's it's a great building. It's a great city. It's a needed niche. It's it's uh, I don't know what it would take. You know, I, you know, the money's going to be there. So it, it would take a significant event to occur that's really going to cause us a problem. Uh, are you looking for any other sources of investment other than the real estate investment trust? Are we looking at other sources? Yes, uh, there are others that Kwanis, we get approached. We like this one in particular. Um, uh, and, and I said we, we should have the term sheet that's either going to come tonight, tomorrow. So we like this, but there are others that we've been, we have talked to. So it's not like we put all of our eggs in this one uh, investment basket. There are a number of, of people that have shown a lot of interest in this. And it, I'll, it just if I could digress for a second, it's interesting you know, in terms of, I went to New York about six months ago start talking to people about this project uh, and and it was really interesting the response uh, the response was they know what's going on in Durham they've heard of what's going on in Durham and they would like to be a part of Durham these are Wall Street firms these are private family offices they are ec private equity people there's a, a you know Durham is you know a buzz of what's happening in, in, in the financial sectors. And so uh, whether it's the Duke influence, because you have a lot, of, you know, a lot of graduates from Duke that are up in Wall Street that know what's going on, but there's a buzz about what's going on in Durham. And, and so we get approached all the time about, are we interested in talking to them? We 
Paul had another country call the other day from a very large life company. We're interested in being a partner. We're not sure we want it or not, but there's, it's, it's easier now than it was. Thank you. Let me ask, uh, this next question is for Kevin. And it has to do with the agreement specifically. Um, we've been rather specific in the agreement in terms of the payment, in terms of dollars that incentives that we're going to provide the developer assuming he meets certain certain criteria. Uh, I'm not as comfortable with the way we've talked about this term capital investment. And this let me tell you, I, I've said this once before. Uh, the capital investment that we're looking at is really going to be what this goes on the tax books for. That's, that's the bottom line to it in terms of because we're talking about being able to derive a certain uh, amount of tax dollars from the investment in this property. And that's going to be based on the valuation of the property and the tax rate at the time. And the exhibit that you use, uh, D, which we don't show in the agreement, but you use in part of our uh, memos that you handed out, assumes that we're going to receive a certain dollars uh, in tax revenue from this project based on a given tax rate, based on a given capital investment evaluation. Uh, my, my preference, because, and the, the reason I, I, I raised this question, I raised it once before, there are going to be two reassessments of property uh, by the time this 15-year agreement is done. We're going to have a reevaluation that comes up in the next couple of years. Uh, this is a 15-year uh, agreement, and we'll have another one. And more than likely, the first evaluation is going to possibly hit the, the value that we've got in terms of 65 million, whatever the dollar is. Um, but no, and more than likely, we find that the tax rate tends to go down when we have reevaluations because the property tax, the property assessment has gone up. Uh, we try to make it neutral, so <coughs> more than likely, the tax value goes down. If tax rate goes down, if it doesn't, that's a different issue. So I, I'm suggesting we're probably going to have two different reductions in tax rates over the time of this agreement. And my concern is that I would rather express the return in terms of absolute dollars rather than the way we have it written in this agreement. So three years, four years, five years, six years, whenever time people begin to look at this agreement and they say, well, how much did this project bring in? They should know that it brings in at least this number of dollars. And I would like to see it expressed in that rather than the way it's, the way it's written in the agreement. And I, I guess I would defer to whoever our people are on, on looking at this. But my concern was that as it relates to the property assessment, minimum city taxes of $327,000 over the term of the agreement. I would prefer that we talk about the cap a minimum capital investment that yields at least $327,408 in property taxes. That way, there's no question about what we expect this property to return, rather than talking about the tax rate uh, percentage the way you have expressed there. I, just like you've said, you've said that you're going to put, ex make a payment of $277,000, whatever it is, to the developer over the 15 years. I would like something written in that says we would expect this property return would be at least $327,408. So it, it won't be any question when somebody looks at the agreement two or three years from now, uh, are we meeting the agreements? We know the dollars are coming in. If it's not coming in at least that, then we know we're not meeting what we, what we expected. Because we're going to be giving out a certain level of payment for 15 years. And I want to make sure that this property brings in at least $327,408. Now, I know the additional dollars that we're talking about in terms of sales tax and hotel tax and et cetera, is t that to me is gravy. Uh, we, we, it's no certain that we're going to get that, but we need, need to be certain that we're going to get the least, the minimum dollar amount that we made our projections on uh, in the project. Understood. So, and I guess this was in section, I'll give you the section it was in. It was, it was in the, uh,
it was an agreement, item two, and it was section 2.1, capital investment. Uh, the way it's written, it says, refers to expenditures that are subject to city and county property taxes and are consistent with the type of capital investment expenditures defined in blah, 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 blah. I, I would just prefer us to say that we would, the resulting city taxes from this property should at least be $327,408. Uh, if it's more than that, fine. But if it's any less than that, then we, I, we, aren't, we, aren't, we aren't meeting the agreement that we want. As it is now, we're just netting, and when I say just, I'm not just minimizing it. We're just netting, in terms of revenue, about $60,000. If you look at the property taxes, that we ex the property revenue we expect to bring in, and the amount that we're paying out. So if that goes down in an appreciable amount, uh, it's, it's almost neutral. So. so so I'm clear, Mr. Mayor. You would like section 2.1 in the definition section to refer to capital investment that yields yes. 327,000. Yeah, at, at, at least. At least 327,000. Yeah, it comes in more. We expect it to come in more. But uh, it needs to be at least said. So that makes it uh, independent of whatever the tax rate is. Mayor, if I might, uh, uh, David Boyd, Finance Director, I, I think we have to be somewhat careful in how we structure this so that it, it we're not talking about a, a tax rebate, which is, as you know, something that, that, that we can't do. Um, uh, but the way we've tried to mitigate your concern is, as you know, the property tax portion that the percentage of property tax that's being, uh, th that results in the incentive payment is about 80 uh, is what, what's about about 80 percent of, 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 the, of the property tax where and I believe the county is in at like 62 percent of their projected property tax revenue and then in our projections of property tax revenue we have used a number about 10 percent lower than the 65 million dollar number that is in the agreement so we've tried to build in conservatism uh, to protect from exactly what you're saying um, I, I think the way this agreement is written is consistent with some of the other agreements that we've done, and we've tried to address that concern by being conservative in the assessed valuations, as well as not pledging the entire amount of the incremental revenue. And then, as you said, there will be uh, additional revenue that would spin off from uh, occupancy taxes and sales taxes. So um, we believe that the number that is there does protect to a certain extent from what you're concerned about. I think the other difficulty in, in how you're describing um, a guaranteed property tax is that rate variability. You know, the, the valuation of what they build could be, you know, where we need it to be, but if, if subsequent councils, you know, significantly reduce the property tax, not that we're seeing that, that happen, that, that would back it down to a number that might be below the threshold over which nobody would have any control. I understand that, and that's, that's a concern that I have. It really is. And I, I, I know the issue about, you know, not saying that you're trading property taxes for investments, but the fact is the way it's written in here, that's, that's what you're doing, or that's what we're doing. And my, my concern, again, is that we ought to have absolute surety that the property revenue that comes from this, this investment at least meets a certain minimum. Now, whether it's based on the fact that the tax rate has gone down and the property has gone, valuation has gone up to meet it, that's, that's immaterial to me. What's, in, what's material is the fact that we assure ourselves or we assure the public or reassure anybody that looks at this document three, four, five, ten years from now that they know we ought to be receiving, that property ought to at least be putting off $327,000. And we can do what we want with it. I mean, we, can, we say the $327,000 is fine. We take the $327,000 and put it someplace else because we aren't saying where this money is coming from. It's coming from the general fund. But at least we know the general fund gets $327,000 plus each year so that if we're giving them this set amount of payment that we said that we're committing ourselves to do, we know we have some place to get it from. So I, I just, I just because, let me tell you another reason I'm raising that question. <laughs> it goes into a little history. But, you know, I was here when we did the American Tobacco parking piece, and I know what we went through in terms of trying to say, well, because we're going to build a DEX, we're going to get a certain amount of value out of the American Tobacco company, uh, project, and therefore we're going to pay off the debts. I bet you right now if somebody went back and looked at that, that agreement, you couldn't, they wouldn't know what you're getting. 
they would know where we're getting. And I, I think we're smart enough with our legal staff to do that, but I just want a fixed number in here that this generates. And we put the money where we want to put it. And we find the $327,000 from someplace else. We're not saying that's where we're going to get it from. We're just saying we just want to make sure it gets there. So I, I'd like you to give that some serious consideration because I'm not going to be here two, three, four, five years from now. Somebody's going to be here paying this, this debt. And they don't know why they're paying it and what's the basis for it. And the basis is that we've got an investment that's contributing to the general fund of at least $327,000 plus thousand dollars. We might not use that 327000 We might use the $327,000 from American Tobacco. Use it from all these property taxes that come in to, to pay it off. But at least we know it's bringing that amount in here. I, I, I know our attorney has something to say why we can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fred, Fred Lamar with the city attorney's office. Um, listening to your comments, Mr. Mayor, I mean, I think they, they make a lot of common sense and there may be some in my opinion from the little bit I've heard there may be ways to to um, get more certainty um, in the agreement than what you currently see or what you've seen in prior agreements but you know this the way this was drafted is consistent with the the current policy in place with regard to looking at capital investments and there's a, dr a purpose in having the policy written such that it is not a direct um, link to actual tax revenues uh, uh, that come into the, the, the city for the, for the purpose of avoiding conflict with the, well, the tell, state tell, constitution. Tell, tell, me how, tell me how this agreement doesn't already say that. Well, I think that it, 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 I think speaks, that it speaks specifically to the capital investment of this project. It doesn't speak specifically to any capital investment. It speaks specifically to this. That's and, and because we haven't couched in dollars, We've counted, counted in percentages, but it's speaking to this project. I think that's that's true, and, and we know that there's cost associated with constructing the improvements, but as you're pointing out, we don't know the exact valuation, um, you know, when it's completed, the exact valuation with a reevaluation. We don't know those numbers. But, you know, we're here to, e even the, the general statute that authorizes um, incentives specifically speaks to increasing the tax base. So. So that's a um, clear uh, motive um, for us to provide the incentive is to make property improvements that will result in increased tax values. The only issue is can we directly link our, directly link our incentive to the actual tax value, the, the tax revenue for a given year? And that's, that's what's problematic and what I think we have, um, at least the policy has historically avoided up to this point. Well, again, I, I'd like you to come back and tell me why we can't do it, because I'm not comfortable with that. I'm personally not comfortable with that uh, when you speak specifically to this project in terms of capital investment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not, you're not speaking to other projects. You're speaking specifically to this, this project. You want to have at least this amount of capital investment. And I'm just saying, fine, couch it in terms of dollars of investment. I um, wonder if it's possible to say, you know, insofar as the tax revenue realized on an annual basis is less than $327,000, that owner of the property will make a payment that provides the difference between that tax revenue and $327,000. I, I wouldn't recommend yeah. that. I wouldn't. Councilman Shul, I mean, that would be a direct, I mean, that, that would almost be a direct correlation to a rebate, which is specifically disallowed by statute, so I think. I'm not trying to get a rebate. Right. <laughs> I'm not trying to get, I'm, it, I'm, it, just, trying to, just, I'm just trying to assure that mm -hmm. the projections that we've all depended on, that this increased property value is going to, net at least $327,000. That, that's, that's all we're saying. Well, I, would, would I, if, if I could recommend, yeah. I know this, uh, the council has been considering, a, or will, will be considering revisions to the, uh, the policy, particularly in light of its, 
its discussions with the county at some later date. I know there's an item on tonight, but yeah. but um, this type of issue, in in my opinion, is better addressed um, if it is reflected in the policy. Because again, this agreement was drafted consistent with the current policy, um, which is what has been used for you know up to this point most all of the incentive agreements that have come before you, including American Tobacco, um, my preference would be to, uh, to address it in a, a full manner um, as part of the, a policy and have it adopted into the policy if we can find um, a, a, you know, a consensus as to how to more directly assure the, the city council and the city um, of the type of uh, Revenue or income that that you're looking for that would be my my recommendation to the council uh, There have been a lot of questions on the new economic development policy that have already been asked by one of the council people I, I have a couple of questions myself uh, But it doesn't relate specifically to this point that I'm making and I guess I'm I, I love the project I think it's a great project uh, but I'm not going to be here 15 years from now, 10 years from now, sitting at this desk when the city has to fork over the payments they've got to make. And I just think it's a clear, clear understanding of why we're making it and what the basis is. And if for whatever reason the property tax yield comes less than $327,000, then people ought to know that that isn't projection because I, I was interested you didn't put that exhibit in in this document which showed the cash flow you in, exhibit in D the, in, the ex exhibit, in the presentation yeah. it, um, no I mean in, 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 the, the, in the agreement in the agreement uh, you have you have uh, and I'm probably taking too much time on this you have an exhibit D in one of your memos right. which is the cash flow exhibit okay cash flow exhibit it, it, I thought it would have been on your, your yeah. iPad. I mean, no, it's, 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 in, it's, the it's, it's in the memos, but it's not a part of the agreement. It's not, it's not, it, a, it, it, it's not attached it, to it, the agreement. It's, it's, it's not attached to the agreement. And I don't know why, but. Well, I mean, we was, can, we can make it an exhibit to the agreement. I mean, it was listed as one of the, the elements for your review, so we can label it an exhibit to the agreement. Well, it wasn't, but you, you had A, B, C, and you didn't have Exhibit D, which shows the cash flow analysis for this project, which okay. specifically says that you project the property tax to be $327,000, and you expect incentive payment to be $264,000, and you put in the sales tax and occupancy tax and all that. But it's not a part of the, part of the agreement. Is it, um, Fred, do you have an opinion as if there, that would be an issue to, to make that a, an exhibit in the agreement? My my legal response if, is if it's if it's if it's not going to be referenced or if it's not going to be part of the agreement, um, why is it in there? Um, I guess I don't recommend putting attachments or exhibits, making them part of an agreement unless you're doing something with them. And so I'd ask that question. Well, let me I tell you what, what what it's doing for me. <laughs> it's, it's asking it's answering the question: How much do we expect this? development to net us and what are we expected to pay out and, and like I say you've been very specific in terms of what we've got to pay out in the, in the agreement but you've been less than specific in terms of what we expect the property tax revenue to be in the agreement so that's, if, that's the issue I have if, if it. it's for illustrative purposes to how we came up with the incentive amount um, that would be one thing but if it were to be linked to um, it's d d that if the revenues did not match what is shown in the cash flow analysis that something else would happen, I, I would question um, the, you know, that, that issue. Well, I, I've, I've made my point, and I've heard what you had to say, and uh, you're the attorney, I'm not. I, I, I still have serious disagreement with, with it because it's no question that everything is tied to the fact that we expect this investment to throw off a certain amount of revenue property taxes, sales taxes, and hotel taxes. And I'm not focusing on that, I'm focusing on the property tax, which is a certainty. And we very specifically said we're gonna give these guys a flat stream of payments for 15 years. And I just think it ought to be saying that we expect this property to at least give the general fund, because that's where the money goes. 
Well, it's not like it's, it's not like the, the money's earmarked for this. It goes into the general fund, and we cut, take out of the general fund the two hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars. It could be coming from all of our taxes. <laughs> it could come from all of our taxes to pay it off. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm through with it. I'm gonna vote against it, but I'm through with it. Go ahead. All right, recognize Councilman Moffitt. It, um, Mr. Boyd, just so that I can refresh myself on this. You said that in that Exhibit D, which is the cash flow analysis, that the tax, rev the property tax revenue that's in there, can you, can you tell me again the calculation that was used to, to um, derive that number? That, that's based on uh, an estimated assessed value of uh, $60.9 million um, net of the existing $42,500 of property tax from the existing structures and, and land values that's currently there. So it's incremental tax revenue based on a $60.9 million assessed valuation that was provided by the uh, county, tax, uh, county tax assessor when she evaluated the plans for the project. Um, I, I think she has historically been quite conservative in her estimates. Um, and. So let me be sure that I understand. So it's 100% of the property tax that would be derived at today's property tax rate times 60 point mil, or at, at $60.9 million? Correct. Okay. So it's net, net, net of the exit, subtract from that the existing uh, tax revenue that flows from the project today. Yes. Okay. So and when you talk about a, I heard you say something about eighty percent. That that so that's the, the eighty. That's the not the. So the the tax revenue calculation that results in three hundred and uh, that that results in three hundred and twenty seven thousand four hundred and eight dollars as the mayor's reference is from that calculation. The incentive amount of two hundred and roughly two hundred sixty five thousand dollars is eighty percent of that number, eighty point nine percent of that number. That's irrelevant. That's that's just a, that's. A, I'm, I'm just, an, I'm just yeah, answering his yeah, question. Yeah, but that's, that's really it's irrelevant. You're just taking the percentage of money we're going to give back to them from what we get. I, that's 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 irrelevant as far as I'm concerned. What, what, what's more important is the fact that you said what we expect the revenue to be from the evaluation of this property, and I'm just saying that you can say that in terms of dollars, and I'm saying we're going to put it in the general fund, and you don't say where we're paying the money from. You aren't saying where we're getting the stream of money. It's not like you were saying, we're going to take $327,000 and put it in the general fund, and we're going to earmark $267,000 of that to go back to pay off this $3 million debt we loaned them. We aren't saying that. that that's correct. Okay, and I'm not saying it either. I'm just saying we ought to say, here's the dollar stream we expect at least to come back from this, this development. It, I've wasted enough time, and I, I cut in you, Don, and I apologize for that's that. Okay. It's, it's not a problem. Um, the minimum capital, minimum required capital investment is $65 million. Um, why did you use $60.9 million? We used the, the assessed valuation that came from the tax assessor's office. Ah. It, it's, it's two different definitions. Kevin's using a definition based on the developer's projections on what the project will cost and what qualifies as a capital investment per our definition. We're using a number that we believe more accurately reflected the tax revenue that we would expect to get. Yes, I, I think I understand. The, the tax administrator said we think the appraised value will be $60.9 million. And they have some schedules that are provided by the, the state that they follow, and so we rely on what the, what the taxes will actually be calculated okay. from. Thank you. Mr. Lamar, did, if I'm, just to be clear, so that I'm clear, um, the, if we did anything that looked like we said, well, gosh, if property taxes don't reach a certain level, and, and if the, uh, the project developer here was to say, I'm happy to make a donation to, to, you know, anything between this number and the actual property taxes, that would put us afoul of state law. Is that correct? I'm, um, I don't let me put I think words there in would your mouth. Be a, I think there would be a, a significant risk of that, yes. And, and, um, and what would be, uh, like, would, would it be the, the developer or future owner 
then suing and saying they don't have that obligation or what what's the risk taxpayer could could uh, to any taxpayer could um, file suit for you know uh, violation of the North Carolina Constitution so so just about anybody could bring um, suit in and, and uh, if they were to prevail what would happen I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what you know what the risk is here so well the uh, the agreement would be <clears throat> the agreement would be found to be void uh, would be one one um, one risk um, they may be able there are there are other liabilities I don't know how, how detailed you want to get into it um, in in um, an open session oh, okay but, just fine um, mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Okay. It, 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 so, it, it, you know, when one possibility is not is to say, well, let's figure out a way to make this work better to satisfy the concerns raised. Is there a way to make it? I mean, if we were to take more time, and I'm not suggesting that we would, would there be any place to go to make it the, work to address the concerns raised? I would say there, there may be, um, uh, but I think that to be able to come, with, come up with that right now, again, as, as I, I uh, as just in discussions with the mayor, you know, this is consistent with the current policy, which you all have approved, and, um, and may maybe that policy and that whole assessment of how we look at capital investment and what that means, um, and can we, is there a way to look more directly at, at anticipated revenues? Um, it's worthwhile doing that. Um, I don't have a recommendation for you right now f for this agreement, tell you the truth. <clears throat> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Mr. Hill. It, you're expecting a term sheet in the next 24 hours from your number one lender. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the, the time frame for the approvals that you need uh, in terms of th this a deal with the city, the, the public-private um, partnership here, um, the timing of that? Just the impacts of timing and the importance of when do you need approvals and so forth. Well, I think just like we had in our, our schedule to have it all done in April allows us then to just keep moving the process forward. Yep. Uh, the more that gets delayed, it just delays everything. It doesn't necessarily kill the deal, but it just means our timetable that we put on the, the TV gets pushed back by a certain period of time because now if we're having problems finalizing language or, or the, the arrangement, um, then it's a matter of, okay, what do you do with your construction documents? What do you do with your lender? What do you do with all these things that are variables out there that they're wanting to understand? So, so it does cause delays. And so, you know, we're, you know, hopeful that, that we'll get it all, this all worked out in April and we can just keep moving the ball forward because we really want to be, you know, breaking ground in this fall. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the council. Any comments that you may have, anybody might have, before I call the question. Can I ask uh, Mayor Patrick a question? Uh, Patrick, do you yes. have any comments at all on? I know that puts you on the spot as a department. Yeah, that, that's fine, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, this is the first that I've heard about this particular issue in terms of, and I understand what the mayor, uh, I understand the mayor's question. Um, I, I'd like the opportunity to confer with Mr. Lamar on what we can and can't do, and it's difficult to do that on the fly here today. Right. Um, uh, I, I, I do perfectly understand where the mayor would like to go to, and I'd like to be able to, if we can't go exactly that way, to see if there's another way to go. But again, I'm, this is hard to do on the fly. Well, is it, if we, could we hold this until Thursday? Uh, Madam Pro Tem, I, Pursuant I, to? I, I, I appreciate that. I, we've got the votes to pass it. I support the project. And I'd rather go ahead and call the question okay. and, and let it vote and let me vote okay. against it and All right. move on for the reasons. Okay. Uh, so I'll call the question on item. Okay. Second. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? 
close the vote. It passes six to one with Mayor Bell voting no. Thank you. Let's move to the next item. Thank you. Proposed revisions to economic development policy. Reginald Jones with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, city administration, citizens of Durham. This item proposes changes in the resolution establishing an economic development financial assistance and incentive policy for job creation and capital investment that was approved by city council in April of 2011. The Office of Economic and Workforce Development has conducted a review of the city's current policy and recommends changes and edits to the policy to modify certain existing programs and to provide greater clarity and consistency among all programs relating to economic development incentives and financial assistance. Staff recommends that City Council hold a public hearing on the proposed revised resolution, adopt the revised resolution establishing an economic development financial assistance and incentive policy for job creation and capital investment, include 9th Street commercial corridor and incentive grant programs, designate 9th Street as a targeted area beyond the CDA, create a new private capital investment minimum for building improvement grants in the CDA targeted areas outside of downtown at $50,000, expand the definition of the retail professional and services grant by adding exterior improvements to it, merge the sign and facade grant programs into the retail and professional services grants program. The funding for RPSGs would increase from 15,000 to the new maximum of 20,000. The funds for signage would remain capped at $2,500. Change the time to complete the building improvement grant projects from 12 months to 18 months and change the language of urban growth area to targeted areas beyond the CDA. Uh, Councilman Shul, you had submitted some questions concerning this item. Did you want to deal with them at this time? This is a public hearing, so the public hearing is open. Uh, we have one person that wanted to speak, so we can defer to that one comment and then get back to the council. Uh, uh, Victoria Peterson, you have t two minutes on this item, Ms. Peterson. Since I was the only one, Mr. Mayor, I really would like to have three. But let me just say this. Um, I have a little concern. Um, I appreciate over the last several years the city having this program because it has helped. The only problem that, I'm, that I have been having with it is that for whatever reason over the last few years, I just don't see the African-American community stepping up to the plate to go after some of these dollars to, to, to purchase buildings or either to get buildings and, and refurnishing them or remove or, or to build them up. The only, and I don't want to say anything wrong, so I would like to ask this question. I would like to know how many buildings are downtown that are now owned by African Americans. Not that they're just, just leasing space, but they actually own the buildings. Because right now, I only know of one. And over the last several years, and because I remember going to the Committee on Affairs of Black People, sharing with them that there was going to be a problem if we did not start buying some of these buildings that were going for very low dollars. And now if you look downtown Durham, you're not gonna find that many African-American owned buildings down here. I would like, and I only have a few minutes, I would really still like to tweak this economic program here. Because there's an area that we really do not talk about in Durham and that's, and that's globalism. We have, and I'm, I'm jumping, sort of far ahead because I only have a few minutes, but I do want to mention this real quick. We are partners with very sister cities around the world, but not one of those sister cities is an African-American country. 
And we do have African American countries around the world. And I would like to see, I would like to see, and for instance, one, if you don't know, is the continent of Africa. Yes. We do, there are countries on that continent that we can partner with, Kenya, South Africa, where we have those folks that actually live here in the country. Okay. Um, but anyway, Mr. Mayor, uh, I would you. like for us to sort of expand our economic development program here. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Uh, you've heard of Tanzania. <laughs> yeah. you've heard, that's a, one of our sister cities. Uh, Arusha. Arusha, Tanzania. That's, that's the country. Arusha is a city in Tanzania. Did they just come on? No, no, yeah. I've been there quite a while. In fact, I visited them about three or four years ago. Thank you. It's Chris Cosmosu. Do you want <laughs> do you want staff person to ask you? Yes, thank you. Thank you for. Um, I, I I appreciate your preparing some responses. I just want to say that I spoke to the manager this afternoon, and he kind of put me in some context here, Kevin. That uh, I think was helpful to me. Uh, in the sense that uh, what we're really doing, as he explained it, is dropping the 9th Street area in here and making a few other small changes. Uh, and understand that. So rather than asking the questions, can I, uh, what I think I'd like to do is put out some concerns that I've written down here for our future plans, and then maybe you could comment on those sure. if you wanted to. If not, uh, you could save them for when you are working on it. But let me just tell you what I, some of my concerns were. Um, the, uh, we heard Shelley earlier talk about the, the hotel, incentivize, incentivizing hotels. Um, I thought we had reached our target, and when we, when we list the targeted industries, um, I'd be interested in some discussion of that and what that means, uh, you know, how many and why. I'd always thought the target was 700, and I noticed she said 1,200, and so at some point when you all are developing that policy, that's something I'm interested in. Um, and then uh, on page three of this agreement, the, the, why is the maximum incentive 16 percent? Uh, and my, 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 my question really here is, do we really want to continue to be that high? Um, and, and I know we're working on a, a combined economic development plan, and maybe we ought to have a a single figure, which city and county public develop, public investment together equals a certain uh, percentage. Uh, but I, I worry that, uh, l l let me put it this way, don't we want to begin to create different lower expectations in developers who review this policy? That is, if we're going to be weaning people off the idea that every time they come to Durham, they can ask for a certain incentive and get it. Uh, if they see a maximum number, I think that it's quite likely that they might seek to hit that maximum. Um, and so I just want to express that concern uh, that when we think about the new plan, we think about what should the maximum really be and can it be lower than this. Uh, also on page three, we talk about the fact that the 16 percent maximum incentive can be exceeded to the extent required to offset increases in rates for parking spaces that are leased. I just want to say that this strikes me as, as counterproductive in terms of our, our desire to make, make parking more market-based, uh, market rate-based, which I think is, a, is, is great that, that the city is moving in that direction, and I really appreciate the efforts that our transportation department and, and others have put in in that, in that realm. Um, but I, I just want to flag that as what seems to me to be counter to that. And then finally, um, I'm, I'm going to skip a few of the smaller points, but I, I've noticed this several, several times. Uh, actually, I take it back, not quite finally. Uh, now that the UGA no longer exists and in light of the new annexation laws, I can't understand why would we want to be incentivizing capital investment outside the city limits when we're not going to collect any taxes on that real estate. I can certainly see why we might want to incentivize jobs outside the city limits, but not capital investment especially in light of the new annexation laws, which makes it impossible for us to uh, annex without a different, whole different level of consent than was previously required. So I just want to flag that as another concern. And then um, at page nine at the top, the tax increment revenue must exceed the city incentive. That's good. 
but I, I'm interested in, in including some percentage by which it must exceed the city incentive. So in a way, I think this would give us more assurance when we're talking about the kind of issue that the mayor raised earlier. If we had a higher level of higher percentage, if we had some percentage that we felt comfortable that the incentive, that the incremental revenue must exceed the incentive by, then we would feel more comfortable, uh, I would feel more comfortable, uh, if, if, uh, if, if, if things didn't go quite as, as, as well as hoped, we would have some room in there. Uh, we would still have some room in there. And then on the bonus criteria, we, we currently have a bonus for provised rental apartments. And given the rash of apartments springing up downtown, um, I wonder if it, it makes any sense to use that as a bonus criteria. We also specify workforce housing in, in bonus criteria too, and uh, I, think we ought to, I think we ought to offer a bonus for affordable housing, and we ought to define that in some specific way. So workforce housing or affordable housing, is, as we've all discussed many times, is a vague concept. Uh, and I think if we could apply some specificity, you know, how about a setting the standard of 60% of the area median income or something? Uh, I'm not necessarily proposing that standard, but using it as an example of something that we might say is uh, that a bonus would, would, would accrue to you if, you if you had that in there, not just rental apartments or workforce housing. So anyway, I'm finished. Uh, I'm really, you know, any, any of that that you would like to respond to would be fine, but I'm, I, uh, I, I am comfortable with the explanation that the manager gave me in terms of the fact that we're going to get this policy back and when the city and the county have, for a big review, once the city and county have negotiated something through your good offices. Uh, but I did want to at least flag those things because I think that they're, those are all things that, if we were adopting this policy today as a big long-term policy rather than just a small change for the 9th Street, I would definitely not be voting for it because I, I would not be comfortable with all these criteria. So, excuse my overlong speech, but I did want to uh, make those points. Uh, Councilman Schull, we, we appreciate the thorough review. I think for um, the sake of time, it probably would be better for us to give more answers when we bring back the policy um, as we've done in the past. We've gone through it section by section and talked about the changes. I think a lot of what you see in there um, was uh, developed based upon a different time. It was based upon a different uh, situation and not just downtown but the community development area around downtown and urban growth areas and so forth but we'll take um, your uh, recommendations un um, under strong consideration and we'll bring back um, a policy that we hope will um, address a lot of the city and county concerns thank you thank you mr. mayor thank you uh, I'm, I'm going to ask if you would look at that definition after Steve just recommended just pointed out tax increment revenue based on current rate exceeds center incentive. I'd like you to look at that relative to the conversation you just had earlier. The other part of your uh, proposal that I had some thoughts about on jobs, uh, what isn't clear to me is, are we speaking about jobs for Durham City residents? Because that's, that, that doesn't come through in the proposal. And somehow I would like us to tie the jobs this is item four, which speaks about standards for jobs. Uh, why can't we tie the jobs that are created be for residents of Durham? I mean, you can get a company that comes in here and, and has 100 new jobs, and 90 of them can be for residents outside of Durham. So wh why can't we tie it to the fact that those jobs are for persons who are residents of Durham? Now, they might move here once the job is established, but if they're living in Durham, it gets counted. If they aren't living in Durham, uh, I don't see why we should count that. Would you like that answer now or defer? Oh, you can, if you can answer it now, fine. But oh. uh, I've carried you too late anyway. I thought we'd be out here by soon. So <laughs> since we're going, well, since we're on, I'm going to adopt it. You can answer it later. But I, I just would like to see a rationale for why we can say that those jobs that are created are for Durham residents, and when we track them, they're in those jobs. They're still a Durham residents. I, I don't want us creating. I don't want us giving incentives for companies that create jobs that don't go to Durham residents. I guess that's the other one I'm saying. All right. any, any other comments? This is a public hearing, so I'd like to ask anybody in the public who wants to speak other than those that have spoken. 
uh, let the record reflect no one else has speak, close the public hearing. And I, I guess I would entertain a motion that we continue this report until we get the answers that uh, have been raised by the council. I, I'm not saying adopt it now. We, you want us to adopt it now? Because the, the recommendation is to adopt so that we can employ. Well, see, the, the problem I have with adopting again is this job space. And I, I just got caught up on this, this other one before, and the reason you didn't want to do it because it wasn't in the policy. So, I mean, if it's a rationale for making it specific to Durham residents, and you want to make it now, fine, but if you right. got to go think about it. I, Mr. I if, if the council would prefer to defer, you know, the impact is that we just won't be able to Im implement any of the uh, incentive program or the improvement programs for the Ninth Street area merchants. Right. Uh, that, that's the I guess the question is how soon can you come back with a, It with will an be probably after the summer break is my, my guess before we come back with uh, Why not work the, session? If, well, if we, if we come back, I, I guess, uh, Mayor Bell, yeah. our original intent was to bring this policy forward when the city and county had jointly developed an economic development strategic plan. It was the des desire of council articulated at the February 6th work session that we should bring back an amendment that would enable us to administer economic development grant programs in the Ninth Street uh, Design District. And so this policy amendment had that specific purpose. We knew that we were gonna go back and look at the other sections in their totality um, when we developed a joint economic development strategic plan. That work um, is, is, is ongoing and we intend to, to bring um, a draft, at least a draft plan to you um, later in the, in the spring or, or early summer. But so, the, I mean, the, the purpose of this amendment was so that we could do Ninth Street economic development improvement in conjunction with the private development that's going on in the west side of the street. And, and so that was the purpose of, of this amendment. Mo mostly what would happen in the Ninth Street design district would not create a lot of jobs anyway because it's really smaller building improvements, facade improvements that aren't gonna have a big impact on job creation in any event. And so any policy change in that regard wouldn't be very impactful. Okay, so you're telling me you need it to do what you wanna do on in Ninth Street. In order to do uh, Ninth Street, it's, it's, we, we The need jobs it. portion right. isn't gonna be seriously impacted. That's correct. But, uh, no. All right, well, I, I, And I don't think we have any other uh, incentives in the queue that I can think of, Kevin, that are j job uh, job oriented in the next month or so? No, not in the next month, no. All right, all right. I, 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 yes, you don't mind. Mr. Mayor, I'd move approval. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, call a question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll go back to the pool item, item seven, on the consent agenda. Uh, Ms. Peterson. <laughs> Telecommunications license agreement with Microelectronics Center of North Carolina. Yes. We've heard a lot of uh, this evening about, uh, about companies and jobs. And I just want to say publicly, I want to thank, I want to thank, thank MCNC, Joe, uh, who has a, telecommunica a telecommunication company here in the Triangle. And I just want to share with the mayor and the city council, several years ago when I brought copper cable and fiber optic to this community to work with ex-offenders, uh, this gentleman with his company hired some of our guys and I wanted the public to know that. Um, I think the public needs to know that when we do business with companies that also if those companies can uh, try to hire our local citizens and this company just did not hire our local citizens. They hired individuals that had challenging backgrounds. Challenging backgrounds. They hired individuals that 
had past criminal records and gave them jobs. And I want to thank Joe, I want to thank his company for doing that, and Mr. Mayor, we need to encourage other companies that want to do business with this community to hire our Durham, our Durham residents, and particularly hire those, hire those in the past who might have had some challenges, but they have overcome a lot of those challenges, and now they are trying to become good, good productive citizens. And I just wanted uh, the mayor and the city council members to know that. Also, I'm hoping in the future that this community will do more business with this company because fiber optic needs to come, and I said this several years ago, to every home and to every building in this community. Fiber optic is high speed. It brings information, it brings data, it brings information quickly to your home and to your business. And for us to really state that we are in the 21st century, we really need to act like we are in the 21st century. So thank you, Joe, and thank you, Council, for allowing me to share that information. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. Entertain a motion on an item, Councilman. Can I ask a question? Yeah, I'm sorry. The what? Your name is Joe what? Fidesso. Okay. Where are you? Where is your company located? No, 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 no. That's okay. That's okay. We can find out. Okay. Move the item, Mr. Mayor. Second. Councilman Moffitt. I just want to take a moment to say thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think, it, I think that what Ms. Peterson has raised is, is exactly right. She's raised it over and over again. It's important to hire ex-offenders, and I appreciate you doing so. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank I, you, I know sir. I have it. I know I have a vote. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We had a motion and a second on that. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Um, any other items to come before the council? I'd like an excuse, um, excuse absence for Thursday's work session. Uh -huh. Second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. Thank you. It passes One seven to zero. zero. Recognize Councilman Brown. Yeah, I need the same. Oh. <laughs> We could have done it together. I move it. All right, it's been proper move and second. Madam Clerk, open the vote. Should have done it together. And close Sorry. the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Any other items to come before the council? <laughs> recognize Councilwoman Katati. Oh, I was just curious if the manager was interested in the need to the Now I have to reevaluate. <laughs> Are you going, you're not I'm going, going to a family country. reunion in Eastern Maryland. Family comes first. All right, no, no further items. The meeting's adjourned at 9.23 p.m. And I apologize for the long discourse I had, but I had to ask Mr. the question. You're the mayor. You can do what you want to do. You're the mayor. Thank you. Steve is normally longest-winded person.